Welcome to Miss Mason Explains Ethics in Psychology. All right, everyone should receive the APA ethical guidelines. We're going to go over a few of the human subject and animal subject guidelines written by the American Psychological Association's ethical guidelines. All right, the first one. Psycho uh, psychologists have to look at um, the risk and the benefits when they are doing research involving human subjects, okay? They have to make sure that the benefits outweigh the risk. Okay, again, the benefits have to outweigh the risk. And if there are risks, they have to find ways to minimize those risks um, to their test subjects. All right, so that's the first. The second is psychologists must show respect and concern for their human subjects. They cannot, um, de you know, defile their human test subjects. They cannot um, make them feel guilty. They cannot... Um, uh, hurt them in any way. They have to show that they have respect and concern for their human subjects. All right, they have to make sure, uh, psychologists, when you are doing um, any type of research, you have to be aware of and adhere to federal and state regulations. Okay, um, if you are using research assistants, the psychologist in charge is responsible for making sure that those research assistants comply with all APA ethical guidelines and with state and federal regulations. Um, if the psychologist is performing an experiment, um, any type of research really, you have to use informed consent, okay? Um, and you also have to inform um, your uh, experimental subjects, um, what is the purpose of your experiment, and what are the risks prior to beginning your research. All right. The next guideline is um, if it is necessary to deceive your subjects because of the purpose of your experiment, you have to make sure that the benefits of that deception outweigh the risk, such as, um, you know, if we're going to do a survey and um, or an experiment, and there's someone injured on the floor if you're testing the bystander effect, um, and they come up across to someone that has been, you know, really injured, you have to deceive your subject um, that the person's not really hurt, it's just they're there as an actor, um, but it's in order to test the, the actual social phenomenon of the bystander effect, and that outweighs the risk, okay? So anyways, and at the end of your study, you have to inform them of the true purpose of their experiment. You can get the actor to get up and say, hey, I'm actually really okay. Please don't be concerned for me, okay? All right. Um, the psychologists have to respect the rights of your human, uh, the human subjects. If the human um, subject wants to withdraw, you have to allow them to. You have to allow them to resolve. If they don't want to do it, they can walk away. Easy peasy. Um, you also, as a psychologist, have to um, protect your humans from mental and physical harm, okay, when they are participating in your experiment. That's huge. Um, the next one is, number nine, is when research um, results in a form of harm, the psychologist who is doing the research has the responsibility to try to repair the damage. So you might have to pay for them to have psychological um, therapy um, or whatever is the damage. The next one, number 10, is information um, about your human participants, the data that you receive. Um, that's considered uh, confidential, confidential unless your human participants have agreed otherwise. All right, and last one, when the research is complete, the psychologist is um, required to provide the participants with information about the purpose of the study and the findings. All right, you've got to tell them what is your findings, okay? All right, now for animal subjects. We do use animals in psychology because sometimes it's unethical to use um, humans, but it's eh, a great area and you can use animals. So the first one, um, if you're going to conduct research on animals, you have to be concerned with the welfare. You have to make every effort to treat your research animals humanely. All right. You have to comply with federal, state, and local regulations for the acquisition, the care, and the di um, the disposal of these animals. All right. This happens a lot when we are trying to do research into um, what happens if we remove this part of the brain. 
Okay. Um, so, you know, you have to care for the animal and uh, dispose of the animal when you're finished. All right. Okay. Um, a psychologist has to um, be trained in the research methods of using animal subjects and they have to have experience in laboratory animals and the care of laboratory animals. Um, this person has to uh, supervise all research that involves the animal. Psychologists must ensure that all people participating in the animal research are trained in the care, handling, and maintenance of the animals being used. All right. Um, and psychologists should make every effort to minimize the pain and discomfort of the animals that are used in the research. If you're going to remove part of the animal's uh, brain, you know, the surgery must be done under appropriate anesthesia. You have to use sterile techniques, um, all of that stuff. All right. And the last one is when is necessary to kill the animal. Um, due to, you know, if you remove a really critical part of the brain, um, please make sure that it's done rapidly and painlessly according to approved methods through the APA and state, federal, and local regulations. Okay. One of the most key ethical practices is informed consent. Now, you guys did um, a fear survey for your warm-up. Now, on the back, um, you were you signed a informed consent um, statement. You were all told if you would like to participate in this um, experiment or not, um, and then you signed it. So informed consent, you have to be informed um, what is the purpose of the research, um, what we are trying to find out, and to give your participants um, a choice do you want to participate in the experiment, the study, um, or not? Okay, so that's informed consent. The next um, ethical practice that we're going to talk about is debriefing. So at the end of all uh, research, you have to debrief. Now, this is an explanation of what is the study, its purpose, any deceptions, and during debriefing, you can even give them an idea of what you have found out. So for example, the debriefing from your fear survey was, um, the purpose of the fear survey was to find out um, exactly, you know, during a survey, do people actually tell the truth? Um, sometimes, no, they don't. Okay, um, what I have found in the last two years that I've done this fear survey during class is that no, um, student, there's always one or two students that say that they will eat the bug, but in reality, they don't. They get really freaky and they don't want to. And then there are some people that say, um, which I found was really interesting, especially with high school students, that they um, said no, that they would not eat a, um, a dried bug of some sort on their fear survey, but then when they're given the opportunity, they want to eat it at the end. It's, it's totally a really crazy psychological phenomenon of the survey. You answer no, but then when you're given the chance to eat it, you're like, yes, let's do this. That's interesting to me. I, I, yeah. So that was the purpose of the fear. So now you've all experienced the informed consent, key ethical practice, and the ethical practice of debriefing. This is Miss Mason Explains ethics in psychology.